I believe that he is who he says that he is. I believe that he is son of the living God. I believe that he is righteousness, that he is my healer, that he is my provider. He is my peace. He is my shelter in the midst of the storm. He's the glory and the lifter of my head. He surrounds me. He is before me. He, he is behind me. He is to the left and to the right. I know that no matter what happens, that he is not only with me, but he is for me. I believe. I believe he is who he says that he is. I believe that he's a soon and coming king. I believe that the, on the horizon, folks, on the horizon we see this as we are moving into the end days, as we're moving into the, the, he said, the great and terrible day of the Lord. It is great if you know Jesus. It's going to be terrible if you don't. Amen. At Revelation 3.10, he says, I will keep you from that hour, the trial that's to come upon this earth. And I know that he's with us. And I believe. I believe because he's done so much up till now. He's done too much for me not to believe. There's just so much stuff that has taken place and has happened in the grace and his provision that, you know, if you, if you do not believe, it's because your believer's broke. And he can fix that too. Amen. Okay. This morning, we're going to talk about finding trouble and finding grace. Finding trouble and finding grace. You're wondering about that, aren't you? Well, as, as the Lord begin to just release some of these things, you're going to find some encouragement because I know all of us have, have walked through some trouble. And in addition to and everything that else is going on, we can, find, we can find his help, we can find his hope, we can find his grace. Um, to give you a little bit of insight of where this is coming from, in Psalms chapter 3, if you would turn with me to Psalm chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up, verse 1, Psalm chapter 3, the, the, the verse is 1, the chapter is 3, the book is Psalm. If you're wondering where that is, and you brought, you brought the paper edition and not the electronic edition, but both of them, uh, the, the, I can help you out with the paper edition. It's near the middle of the book. Right in the middle of it. So if you're if you're hunting for it, if you're if you're on the electronic edition, uh, I don't know what's in the middle of your electronic edition. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Candy Crush. I have no idea. But here we go with Psalm chapter three, verse one. It said, "A Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom his son." And we're going to talk about that. So hang on, Lord. How they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. The glory and the one who lifts up my head. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I'm asking that not only you allow your word just to, to be quickened to our heart, but we'd have the understanding and the knowledge that you're trying to impart to us that's going to carry us through no matter what takes place, no matter what position, no matter what storm, no matter what 2020 has brought or what 2021 will bring. Lord, you're with us. And you will carry and you will heal and you'll provide time and again because you are the glory and the one who lifts up my head. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn to somebody close by and say, I'm ready. I'm ready for something good. I was talking to somebody and, and they, was, they was saying to me, well, you know, 2021 has got to be better than 2020. 2020 has been just one of those years that has been paramount in the, in the bad category. There's got to be something better. And I said, well, if you're living in 2021, and actually the, the, the end times are taking place, you're not necessarily going to be better in that regard that you're thinking. See, you're, you're perceiving something that is good in, in the financial or in the flesh. But I believe the Christian in the end days is going to be moved 
from the world or from the fleshly realm and going to be given a greater authority because you're going to, your reality and the way you live is going to be transcended into the spiritual or the supernatural. You see, we have dwelt in this land of ease for a long time and I, I think it's so appropriate that the church will be challenged because there's something that happens when the church is challenged. When the church gets challenged, there's two things. Number one, that the sheep are parted from the goats and the, the remnant, the pure remnant of God is hung on to. That scarlet thread that's woven down through the scripture and down through the ages, I believe that that church and that body is going to be given that authority to be the, the provision in this end times, to be given the anointing for the gospel and for, the, and, and for all that's going to take place. How many believe that there will be one more great awakening? One more time, one more opportunity, one more given. A Smith Wigglesworth prophesied that before he died. And he said that he's seen a great revival, one great revival that would shake the nations. It's also seen in the scripture. I believe that's what it was referring to. He said, and in that day, just as the water covers the sea, so will the glory of the Lord cover the face of the earth. And that has not happened yet on the planet. And I believe that in that day, he's talking about this day, that that's going to take place at the glory of the Lord. And who ushers in the glory? The presence of the Holy Spirit through God's people. Do you want to be part of that? That was your opportunity to say amen. As you, as you look forward to that, know this. Jesus said that in the end days... Because the disciples said, we would like to know what's going to happen. Would you tell us more? And then he said, there will be these things that take place. Wars, rumors of wars, pestilence and disease. There, there are all these things that are taking place. He said, and that is the beginnings of woe. That's the beginning of the sorrows, but not the tribulation. The great tribulation is not. A lot of people think that perhaps that we're now living in the great tribulation, the first three, three and a half years. And uh, there's, there's something, there's something that, there's a number of things that got to take place. If you are uh, someone that is a scholar of eschatology, you understand there's a few things that have to take place. Do, someone asked me, do you, well, do you believe, do you believe that the Antichrist is alive today? I believe so. He has not yet ascended to power. There's not that the, the beast with ten heads, and he is to come out of that. In other words, the ten nations, the ten Middle Eastern nations are going to come together as a conglomerate, as a union, and that he will come out of one of those. That's very specific that the Scripture said. He has not yet been revealed. That has not yet happened. There's not been peace in the Middle East because he will cause peace to take place in the Middle East. But it is a false sense of peace. How I many you know that? the middle of the great tribulation, he will set up his own image in the temple. That's the abomination that causes desolation. That's what very specifically the scripture says, that he sets up his image in the temple. Temple is yet to be built. Can it be built quickly? Yes. Those of you that have been to Israel and you went to the Temple Institute, and anybody been to the Temple Institute in Jerusalem? couple of you, then you understand this, that they have all the materials for the exact replica, the exact size of the, of the temple to be built. They have all the materials, all the stone that has been, has been pre-quarried and it is ready to go. All the timber, everything that they need to erect the temple on the temple mount when they're given opportunity. And it will happen quickly. They say they can have it erected in less than three months without a single hammer sound being made at the temple mound, just as it was before. That's exciting to me. The priest, the priest garments, and they have, they have one there that's on display. They have already, they've made the garments for the priest already. They, they have found a, a pure lineage, a pure strain of the red heifer, so that they can be, a, a sacrifice can be made. They have a replica already of the altar of incense and the, the candlestick, which has a, it's a big candelabra with, with 12 individual stems that is ready. That's part of the furniture. The altar of incense, the altar of sacrifice. Those things are already in place. What they're waiting for is the Ark of the Covenant. 
And some say they have found that in a warehouse in the United States. Never mind, never mind. That was, uh, <laughs> that was a joke, if you're wondering, really? Yeah, Indy found it, remember? I don't know, there's a lot of speculation whether that is or, or the Lord took that into heaven or whether that's going to be. But I'm, I'm just giving you this some insight. Those things can be placed and can be put into motion very quickly. But I believe that we're in the end days, but yet not in the, entering into the great tribulation. Just because of what the Word says. Not my own speculation. This is what the Word says. And you've got to go to Daniel. You have to look at Matthew. You have to look at the book of Revelation to understand those things. If you want to know more information, please, I would love to sit down with you and just give you some insight along those lines. I spent years studying eschatology, understanding the time frame and the, the sequences of what's to happen. Because he said, I do not want you to be unaware. You, no man knows the hour or the day when the Son of Man will come. Jesus said that. No one knows. But he said, you can know the season. And when you see these things happening, Jesus said, look up. Your redemption draws nigh. But until that moment takes place, until he turns to Gabriel and he said, sound that trumpet, that special shofar that has not yet been sounded since it was made. He said, he's going to turn to him and sound that trumpet. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we which are alive and remain should be caught up together in the clouds and forever be with the Lord until that moment that you need to be ready. And even though the trouble comes and trials and tribulation come, that also know that grace is here. Some are wondering about what is going on in my life. Why am I dealing with all this stuff? Say amen because I've been praying with a lot of you along these lines. Okay, help me out. We're going through it, finding trouble, finding trouble. David found trouble. He found it because he caused it. It was in his, he turned a blind eye to the, the things that were going on in his own house. One of his sons raped one of his daughters. And that's why Absalom rose up in anger. And that's why it was going on. And he was running for his, he not only got run out of the very palace, but now he's running for his life. When he's writing this, when he wrote this song, he said, he said, there are a lot of those that have risen up against me, his own son, trying to kill him. He found trouble. How many of us would say that law of reciprocity, whatever I've sown, I also reap and, and and the uh, Lord will forgive us of sin, but oftentimes we have to reap what we have sown. I'm so thankful he is the Lord of the harvest, and oftentimes he removes that harvest of trouble. Even though we've sown it and we deserve it, he's removed it. Somebody say amen. amen. But if you go and murder somebody, you can be forgiven, but perhaps you're going to spend some time in jail. That is what I'm talking about. We find trouble, and we have sown, and we've sown to the wind, so we reap the whirlwind. That's the word. How many of you understand this? You found some trouble, and it has come to you. And you've asked the Lord, and don't, don't misunderstand me, God will forgive you of the sin, but then there is trouble that comes from the sin. Oftentimes there's trouble that comes to you because of somebody else's sin. And you might be saying, that's not fair. Why do I have to deal with this other person's sin? Because you're in the world, not of the world, but you have to deal with the things of this world who is under the dominion of the prince of the power of the air. I'm so glad his dominion's been broken over me and I have relief and I have release and I have provision and I have rescue. But I'm just passing through. This world's not my home. And the prince of the power of the air will be broken. He's not going to rule over this kingdom. 
His power has been broken at the cross, and he will be bound for a thousand years, cast into bondage, and then released for a season, and then for eternity, placed into the eternal lake of fire. That's his destiny. That's his destination. Your destiny and your destination is to rule and reign with Jesus after he comes back. Until then, we're passing through. So don't get caught up in all the trouble that is taking place. That's the first step of the trouble, trouble I have caused. Here's what I mean. Let's give you a little better insight. I enjoy adrenaline, adrenaline junkie, especially as a younger man. I would purposely do things, take up jobs that were dangerous. Loved it. Worked in the oil field, worked, worked in the woods as, as a cutter, a sawyer, head sawyer. And that's, that's a lumberjack, knocking down trees, big trees. Things like that. Just loved it. Loved motorbikes. Loved intense sports. Most of them I wasn't good at. And I wished I was a little bit better at motorbikes. But I loved it, okay? These are things I, I love doing. And because of that, and, and some of you are with me, some of you understand this, because of that, we're now paying. You pay to play. You used to say, go big or go home. Mm, I should have went home. Because of that, there's aches and pains, and you get up in the morning, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer to get up in the morning because there's things that are going on in your body that you're paying the price for the fun that you had. Amen. That is what I'm saying. You found trouble. You found it, and it came your way. And that's what David is saying. I'm in trouble. But he didn't let his mind focus on the trouble. Now, here's the key. Because trouble will come. We're going to get to that in a minute. It'll come. It's up to me where I'm going to put passion and focus on. He, he, he expresses the situation. But then he, he interjects the provision of grace. He says, verse 3, but you, O Lord. He said, they're, they're, they're surrounding me. There's no help for him. That's what they're saying. There's no help for him. He's going to be cut off. This is the end of David. And at the end of that, he said, but you, O Lord, you are a shield for me and my glory and the one who lifts up my head. Not only are you shielding me, but you're the one that gives me provision. You're the one that has anointed me. And you're the one that brings me from the pain and, and disaster. And you cause me to focus on you. That is the choice in the midst of trouble. When I find it. When I find trouble, it's repercussion. Repercussion. In Exodus chapter 34... Exodus 34, you got to see this as well. Exodus 34, if you would, verse 7. Keeping mercy for thousands. This is verse 7, chapter 34, Exodus, Genesis, second book in the, in, the, in, the, in the Torah, also the Pentateuch. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity, of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. He starts out keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression for sin, but it is not clear the guilty. It's one of God's laws. Found three different times in the Old Testament. This is not just a passing. Sins of the fathers be visited on Children, the children's children of the third and fourth generation. Have you ever wondered why you deal with things that you really never, you really never did, but you're dealing with it? You never really opened the door, but you're still dealing with it? Oftentimes it's talking about a, a generational curse. I've got some good news before you start letting those wheels turn too far. Well, that explains a lot. Maybe my great-great-grandfather was a knucklehead, therefore I'm a knucklehead. I'm 
Before you allow yourself to go down that road, I want you to understand something, that you can be the missing link in this chain of destruction. You can be the one that says it ends here. It ends with me. It ends with my house. This generational curse will be put to an end right now. It's not going to go any further. How many understand what I'm saying? Say amen. I can be the one that causes this curse to not only come to an end, but I'm going to interject blessing to the generations that, uh, that come after me. I will be the one that gives help and hope and provision. My grandmother was a sole testament to the reason why I'm not only alive, but I'm able to worship and able to provide and able to move and minister for the Lord. That's only one reason that my grandmother stood in the place of adversity when the generational curse was upon her house and she drew a line and said, thus far no more. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And because of that, she turned the generations that were known for debauchery, for drunkenness, for adultery, for those that were spending time in prison, life in prison, and she said, not my house, and turn the, the prisoners into worshipers, turn the drunkards into preachers. And that's what took place in my house. And because of that, I say, thank you, Lord, for breaking generational curses. So don't tell me you can't do it. Don't tell me there's no way out and you're just in bondage and you've been in bondage. You will find freedom. Someone say freedom in the provision in the presence. So yes, trouble finds you, but it doesn't have to have you. Trouble will come your way, but you can send it on down the line. When I find trouble, when I find trouble. And then, when trouble finds me. When trouble finds me. In 1 Peter, let me explain this, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Peter 4, 12. He said, Beloved, do not think it strange. Well, you got to underline this one. This will help some of you right now. This is going to bring some answers for you. Some of you are wondering. Why does this stuff always happen? Why is it happening to me? Well, you ain't by yourself. It's happened to everybody. And here's what it says. Beloved, I like that. Beloved, do you feel loved today? Do you know the Father loves you? You are loved. That's what he call you beloved. Do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though something strange is happening to you. Mm -hmm. This is strange. Why is this happening? Because what happens is the enemy wants you to focus on everybody else's blessing, and you see other people's blessing, and you say, well, they're being blessed, and I'm being cursed. They're having a great time, and they're moving through all these wonderful things in their life, and I'm just struggling. And you're thinking, why, God, am I struggling? Everybody else is being blessed. Well, Satan wants you to show them, show you their blessing, and he won't show you their trial. He won't show you how they got to blessing. He just shows you the end result. And that's what you focus on. Well, they just always walk in blessing. Now, they're walking in blessing, but they they went through the fire to get to that blessing. They overcame. They moved some mountains. They too were under oh, the trial. And I like it. He puts it, the fiery trial. It's not just any trial. It's a fiery trial. And he said, so I don't want you, I don't want you to buy into the lie of the enemy thinking that everybody's blessed except you. In fact, he says, he goes, he goes the other direction. He said, I don't want you to think it's strange that you're going through it. Like this is some strange phenomenon. This is just some weird thing that is happening to me. He wants you to get this complex of Eeyore. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Eeyore. The spirit of Eeyore has come upon you. Oh, bother. Thanks for noticing. 
When you have a greater anointing, you have a greater provision that God will give to you. You just got to go through the, I'm going through the trial. I'm not going to sit down in this trial. I'm going to go through the trial because I know on the other side of that, that there's a greater provision. He said this, he gave us some insight. He said, this thing is happening to you. This thing is happening to you. He said, I want you to rejoice. Rejoice in it to the extent that you partake in Christ's suffering that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Somebody got to say amen. amen. That joy that the Lord is giving, he's not just joy, exceeding joy. You get, when you go through it, when you go through it, that's what's on the other side. Now, finding trouble or when trouble finds me. Trouble finds me, the enemy is attacking, the enemy will throw stuff at you, the enemy will try to unravel you, try to f cause you to fixate on all the issues and all the problems. And it will come your way. Peter said, don't think it's strange that this is happening because it happens to everybody. There's just some people that they're, they, they are so used to the trouble that they go through it a lot quicker. They understand the, the authority, the understand how you raise up with that power of the Holy Spirit to engage, overcome, move through, and now you have a testimony. And to rejoice in the testimony. How many are rejoicing in a testimony? You just got a good word. God given you a good word lately, and you need to just hang on to that. This week we're going to celebrate you might be celebrating all alone. You might be celebrating by yourself. Usually you're with family. But this week we're going to celebrate. It's a cel one of the greatest celebrations on the calendar. It is Thanksgiving. And it's not just thankful for food. Although we tend to... Mm, Christians usually glorify that end. And we, we really have a celebration because, you know, there's not a whole lot else you can do and, and still not sin. And then, you know, that's borderline because you eat too much. Amen. Some of you have been saving up, saving up Weight Watchers points for this week. You're going to do it right. No, Bobby's shaking his head. No, I don't save nothing. But I bet you your mama's going to cook you a pumpkin pie or something like that. Maybe. Or your wife going to do it anyway. Whether you're with family or friends, whether you're by yourself, here's the key. Allow thankfulness to rise up within you. Are you thankful for what God has given to you? And, and this is, before we move into finding grace, I want you to begin to cause your mind to be focused on the good things God has given to you this year. In the midst of pandemic, in the midst of trial, tribulation, heartache, pain, problems, financial stresses, I want you to focus and fixate on blessing. You're here in the house of the living God, worshiping, being able to spend time with each other, encouraging each other. That's one thing. You're able to be here and you're not in the hospital fighting for your life. Come on. How many of you, how, how many of you were able to come here uh, in, in a vehicle? Okay, thank God for that. Well, I just barely made it. Praise the Lord, you made it. And we're going to pray you back home so you can come back. <laughs> Amen. Now, are you still with me? I'm, I'm, how many of you have family members that you love? And I had to quantify that. <laughs> How many have friends that are like family? Come on. How many have grandkids? Oh, well, now we're, now we're talking. We got some grandkids. Okay. How many like some more of those? Okay. But I'm thankful for them. I get to see, I get to see some of them this week. And so I'm, we're going to be, we're going to be going to North Carolina and uh, get to see them, grandkids. And uh, 
they haven't, those, those little guys have never seen the ocean, and they live pretty close to the ocean. So one thing I'm going to privilege, and this is joy. This is going to be joy for me. We're planning to take one day, and we're going to go to the ocean and, and, and go put their feet in the sand and let the cold water wash over their head and <laughs> scream in soggy diaper back up to the beach. So I'm going to... That's what I'm looking forward to. That's going to be fun. I'm excited about that. Okay. Amen. Come on. So, so there's joy. And there, that's joy. And I'm thankful for those things. God has given me those things. Could we spend more time with? Yeah. And some would say, well, isn't that a bummer? They moved all the way. Why did they do that? Well, the Lord, Lord directed them that way. It wasn't me. And I'm, say, I'm saying, and my wife, she, she reminds me and, and herself that I'm so glad that, the, that God didn't move them to like uh, China or Israel or somewhere that's a lot further away. At least we know. Anyway, I'm giving you things to be thankful for. Are you thankful? Then return thanks. In fact, let's do that right now with the uplifted hand and the grateful heart. Just begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I want you to just, if you could, the things that come to your mind, to come to your heart, what you're thankful for. Lord, I'm thankful for a church family. I'm thankful for those, the same precious like faith that love you, that are willing to worship. Lord, I am thankful for our health. I'm thankful for your provision. I'm thankful, Lord, for your grace. I'm thankful, Lord, that you have forgiven me. I'm thankful, Lord, that you have purposed us and you've given us a future and I hope, Lord, I'm thankful. I am thankful. I'm thankful, Lord. And with a thankful heart, I will celebrate you this week and what you have done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right there is how you find grace. Finding grace. Trouble might have found you. You might have found trouble. Trouble. But we're going to find grace. We're going to find grace in the midst. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, and I'm sorry that I made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace. This is what I want to encourage you. No matter who does what, no matter who does what, anybody else does whatever they're going to do, set your heart on the worship and the adoration of the king. You belong. You belong to the family of God. You belong to the kingdom. Come on. And so no matter what anybody else does, no matter what anybody else says, you will find grace in the eyes of the Lord. You will find provision in his eyes. Come on. No matter what happens in the rest of the world, no matter what happens in the rest of your family, you find grace in the eyes of the Lord. And you will be the rescue for the rest of the world. You will be the provision for those that need his help. Because his grace that is extended to you and ministers to you will flow through you. Not just to you, flow through you. We see in 1 Samuel chapter 16. I like this. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. You're going to throw that up there real quick. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or the physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He sees what's going on right now. He sees the turmoil. He sees the struggle. He sees how you've been overwhelmed. He sees everything that has taken place. And he sees your heart. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you look at my heart. You look at the things that have taken place. And you know, you know what's going on. And he sees how 
you have loved in spite. He sees how you have given, even though you had nothing left to give. He sees how you worship in the midst of trial and tribulation. He sees how you are moving and ministering in a greater capacity than ever before, and you have been poured out. He sees those things because that's what he looks at. He looks at your heart. And therein is the grace. That's the moment of grace. God's unmerited favor. Now, how does grace work? Grace is something given to you that you did not deserve. You know what I deserved? I deserve death. I deserve punishment. I was talking about me, so you could say amen about that. I don't get amen. Amen, yeah. I know, amen. And that old song, I should have been crucified. I should have been the one to suffer and die. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. That's grace. Grace extends mercy. And through his mercy, we find life. Let me ask you this, in, in eternity, are you going to remember any of these temporary struggles? Let's say two seconds into his presence when all pain and suffering and sickness is gone and you're now ministering and moving in the very glory of an awesome God. Are you going to care that you had to wade through a little bit of suffering and sacrifice I'll promise you, if you can make it into eternity with Jesus, it's not going to matter. This is not going to matter. But Pastor, you don't understand, it's been really hard. No, this is not hard. Like Steve Hill used to say, hell is hard. We are living in a greater blessing. We are living in a greater provision. I have found grace. I have found grace. I should re restate that. I didn't find anything. I found nothing. Grace found me. Grace was given to me. Help was given to me. I was lost. And when I was far from God, he died for me. And he gave me hope. And in the process of this, the ups and the downs, sometimes we're doing good, sometimes we're struggling. Sometimes we're on top of the mountain, and sometimes it feels like the mountain has fallen on me. But through it all, through it all, he has given me a greater grace and a greater provision. In the midst of trouble, and this is what I'm getting to you, and this is with the hope and the help that I want you to receive, is because it doesn't matter if you're the one that has caused the trouble or the trouble has found you and is coming after you. There is a greater grace, there is a greater provision that you've ever known, and he will carry you consistently. Provision comes to you all the time, through it all, every moment, every day, no matter if it starts today and ends tomorrow or continues, you will be carry through it with the grace of God, with the grace and the provision of an awesome God. No, no matter, no matter what hell has in store for you, God has greater provision for you to carry you through it. Now more than that, I like this, more than that, someone say more, more than that, the plans of the enemy will not succeed. He thought he was going to he thought he was going to take you out. How many of you were close? I'm, uh, I, need to, I need you to just recognize this and look around. How many of you was close to death? In fact, you've seen death. Come on, lift up your hands and look around. How many of you, Lord, has rescued you from a terminal illness? Look around, terminal illness. Rescued, okay. How many of you that he has brought you out of bondages and addictions and set you free? Look around. Just I'm, I, You can look around and see that there's going on. Okay. How many of you 
had no provision and no way to make a dime, and God provided for you supernaturally, and now you have provision. How many of you that even though that you turned your back on God at a time and you fell away, he came running after you and he rescued you and you're serving him today. Now give him praise. That's God's favor. That's God's blessing. That's God's ministry of mercy and healing and forgiveness. That's what he gives to you in the midst of all this. And that's what you got to focus on. Quit focusing on the trouble. Quit focusing on the pain. Quit focusing on the problem. Focus on what God has given to you. Now, I did not let my wife know that I was going to do this because she would have probably told me no. But she's going to come and share with you as we close something that the Lord gave to her. She shared it at prayer. And now, would you please? Thank you. And she's, I'm going to hear about this because we're traveling to Denver. I'm going to hear about all the way to Denver. But that's okay. I was going to share it, but the Holy Spirit said it will be more effective coming from your wife. It will be a greater blessing coming from her. And she's going to share this. And then, and then, and then you've got to pray for me. I had to double check and make sure I knew what I was sharing. <laughs> Um, the Lord has been speaking to me about the attack on our minds and, and a lot of different things and, um, and what we focus on. And I know he's been preaching on focusing on the right things. And um, God speaks to me in little ways sometimes. So I drive from Glade Park to work every day. And I love where I live. I never get tired of the drive. I enjoy it. It's peaceful, and it's encouraging to me, and I love creation and what God's created. But in the last couple of years, we've had a lot of drought. Um, we've had a lot of beetle kill, and I have seen all these trees around me dying. And I'm kind of a nature lover, and it just made me sad. And I would see these trees just turning brown, and the needles turning brown, and it would hurt my heart literally like I would just feel discouraged and sad when I looked at them and so about three weeks ago ish um, I was driving to work and I was looking at the trees that were dying and I was just I was just kind of talking to God about it you know it's like look at all these trees Lord they're dying and he's like why are you looking at the dead ones and so, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> and ever since then, every time I drive down the road, I've been able to look at the live trees. And he's like, look at all those live ones. They're prospering. They're growing. They're bearing pine cones, which is their fruit. They are strong. They are healthy. And, and there are seedlings that are coming up. Why are you looking at the dead ones? So it's time for us to get our eyes off of what the world's doing and get our eyes off of what's going on in this world because it's pretty negative. In fact, I don't even watch the news. Um, somebody asked me the other day because we didn't have TV for almost, I don't know, eight months or so. And they're like, how do you get the news? And I'm like, why do I need the news? I hear it like plenty. I, I don't even have to have the news or watch the news to get the news. So... Um, but it's like there's so much going on around us that is so negative, but it is time for us to get our eyes on life and, and our, our help, which is Jesus. It's time for us to focus on what he's doing. He's bringing a revival to our land. Um, and it's time for us to focus on that, folks. There's enough icky stuff going on in our world, but there's a lot of good things that God's doing, and we need to focus on that. Would you stand? Stand with me if you would. Amen. That's my girlfriend. Woo! <laughs> um, so.
Some would say that's easier said than done. What oftentimes has to happen is, Lord, that you just speak to my heart, anoint my eyes, cause my mind and my focus to be stayed on you and the blessing and the provision and your goodness, your mercy and your grace. All the rest of that will pass away. But God in his provision, his grace, his mercy will never pass away. It will always be with you. So I got a couple questions I need to ask. If you just bow your head, it's between you and Jesus this morning. You're here and you've been discouraged and you've gone through it and it's been really hard for you. And it seems like you've, you've that discouragement is just kind of taken a place and it's wearing you out. And this morning you, you're saying you need the Lord's help just to cause you to focus, cause you to look to him to the solace of strength, to the grace, the mercy, and the provision, to focus on his blessing. And you would like that change of heart. You would like that change of outlook. Is that you this morning? Just lift up your hand. I'll pray with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Many, thank you. I need God just to do that work in my heart and my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you lift up your hand, or even if you didn't, you'd like to pray this prayer with me, would you pray it out loud? I know that you can pray, and I know many of you pray. Just your prayers are, are eloquent and powerful and anointed. But there might be someone here that might not know how to pray or what to say, and so that's why I lead you in a prayer. And if you would pray this with me and pray it out loud from your heart. Say, Dear Jesus, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. And you're speaking to me. I need your strength. I need your direction. And I need your focus. Though the trouble come, I know that you're with me. You will see me through. You have already rescued me. You'll do it again. So I look to you. Anoint my eyes to see you and no one else. Anoint my ears to hear your voice and no other voice. Anoint my heart to follow after you. Anoint my mind to be stayed upon you. And in Jesus' name, anoint my feet to walk with you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's give him praise right now. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.